Jesus has been asked questions relentlessly (laughs) over the course of this chapter by the brightest minds in Israel. Jesus asks them back in return one question, and suddenly they don't want to ask any more questions. (laughs) It seems that the tables have turned in this conversation. The, The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the lawyers, everybody was looking for some flaw in Jesus, some question he was unable to answer. Some kind of lack somewhere. But once again, they, will, they are the ones going away embarrassed, coming across as the unlearned ones. Their ignorance, however, is tied to the main theme of this passage here, that there is far more to who Jesus is than meets the eye. Jesus began this narrative with a Very universal question, though, as we pick up in verse 41. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? This question is more profound than we, than perhaps they realized as we begin to unpack this, their, their answer. But yet to this day, there are many questions about the multitudes as to who Jesus is. You know, some people call him a good moral teacher. Others call him a great prophet or a guru or even a Buddha in some sects. But there's a problem with thinking about Jesus that way. You see, good moral teachers don't have worship services in their name. There's... No, the, what, what we are doing this Sunday morning is wildly inappropriate if Jesus is just a more good moral teacher. Are we gathering for a worship service because there's something more to who Jesus is? I hope so. Because even Christians are confused about who Jesus is. Uh, to many, Jesus is their helper, their comforter. The one who we call upon when things aren't going all that well, when we need that little extra help. And now Jesus is all of those things, don't get me wrong. But he's also much more than that too. It was something that they missed here about who Jesus is. But the Pharisees give the obvious answer as to who the son of David is in verse, as we finish verse 42, that they said to him, the son of David. Well, that's who the Christ is, the son of David. This wasn't a hard question at face value. Most people were aware that David's lineage would be the one to produce the Messiah. And 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7 is where God promised as much, saying that, uh, and and it's it's, this, this promise that it would be the son of David, a offspring of David who would be the Messiah is referred to all throughout the Old Testament. Therefore, it was quite significant when the blind men approached Jesus saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. They knew something about who Jesus was. Also, after an exorcism Jesus performed, the men asked, If this could be the Son of David. They knew there was something about Jesus, wondering if he could be this one. But the question is, how could Jesus prove that he was the Son of David? What's to stop anyone from making the claim that they are the son of David? For all, I mean, what's to stop me from saying I'm the son of David? It's an important question. And here's the answer. In the temple, they kept, they meticulously kept genealogical records of every Jew at that time. Careful records of the family lineages of every Jewish person alive in the first century. And for several reasons. For one, because to make sure that only descendants of Levi would serve as priests. The Bible said that only descendants of Levi, of the tribe of Levi, could serve in the temple as priests. If you wanted to be a priest, you had to be a Levite. So they had to make sure that you had the credentials. Furthermore, you wouldn't be allowed at that time to serve in any major public office without being able to prove your lineage. We had to know who you were in Israel at that time. 
But why is that significant for us today? Because anyone back in Jesus' day could just go to the temple and and trace an unbroken line in Jesus' lineage from his father or mother's side directly back to King David. Father and mother, of course, meaning, you know, Mary and Joseph. And, you know, those lit. Those lists that people of names that you see throughout the Gospels, there's one in Luke and there's one in Matthew, but we covered it back in Matthew chapter 1, just a list of names, like sev- something like 17 verses of just a list of names. Some people hate reading through that. It's just, just a boring list of names. What's there to get in this? But those lists are so absolutely essential to the credibility of Jesus because Matthew did his homework back in the day. He traced those records. He could tell exactly how Jesus has the claim to being the son of David. And and, and by the way, because of that point, it was absolutely imperative for the Messiah to have come before 70 A.D., 70 AD? Why is that important? What makes that year unique? Why did the Messiah have to come before then? Because that was the year the temple and all the records inside it were destroyed under Emperor Titus. Not one stone was was left unturned upon the other. And all of those records were destroyed at that point. Many Jewish people today actually have no idea what tribe they are from. Because of, because there's no formal centralized record system anymore. Now, many of them have family traditions, and I've spoken to people who, who believe, you know, yeah, my family tradition says I'm a Levite, and I have no reason to question that. But if somebody comes along and says I'm the Messiah, you better have the credentials to prove it. Exactly. You get it. And it's something to... Uh, remember when you encounter a Jewish friend, how, you say you're still waiting for the Messiah. How will you know? How can you prove it when he comes? So that's why it was important for Jesus to arrive before 70 AD, so there would be a paper trail to prove his credentials to be the Messiah, unquestionably, as Jesus did. However, Jesus was not just the son of David. He was far more than that, too. The scriptures promised that the Messiah was not just going to be the offspring of David, but divine. As we go into verse 43, he said to them, How is it then that David, in the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how is he? His son. Once again, we see Jesus making his argument based off of Scripture. That's worth noting, by the way. And this time he quotes from Psalm 110, our first reading this morning, which is kind of like quoting John 3.16 back in Old Testament times. Everybody knew this psalm. It was so important. It was Everybody knew it was talking about the Messiah. There, people had questions about it, but it was so important to their understanding of who this coming Savior would be. Everyone knew about it. The question is, what does it mean? And it helps to have a little understanding of how to read your Hebrew Old Testament uh, in, in this particular case. To keep it real simple and understandable for all of us, when you read your Old Testaments and you see the word L-O-R-D in all capital letters, all capital letters, that is the word Yahweh in the Hebrew. The, the, the highest, most holy word for God that the Hebrew people had. That, that's what that word is. Now, if it's all lowercase or just with one L, it's another word for Lord. In this case, Adon, uh, referring to a man or a God, depending on the context. It's your Lord, it's your master, it's the person in charge, it's the person with authority. Uh, Abraham is called Lord at one point, but it also refers to God in other contexts. Depends on the context. So when you read Psalm 110 in the Old Testament, verse 1 uses both words. The Lord 
in all capital letters, as in Yahweh, said to my Lord, with a lowercase l, I mean lower, lowercase other words, only the l's capital, said to David's Lord, sit at my right hand, using that other word. So Yahweh says to David's Lord, which is this Messiah, sit at my right hand. So the son, so first and foremost, as we're unpacking this, this son of David, again, son of David, is somehow David's Lord. Well, how is that possible? How does that, how, what, 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 what son or grandson or great lineage is going to be greater than their father? In Jewish terms, that doesn't happen. How could this be? So, the, the, Jesus' question here to these Pharisees is he's challenging them that there might be more to this son of David than they originally thought. Especially as we consider what the rest of this verse is saying, as we consider that it's saying Yahweh, God, is inviting this son of David, this Lord of David, to sit at my right hand. To sit at the right hand, it was a phrase that Jewish people used to convey co-equality, co-equal in rank and authority. I'm not trying to be technical here, but what's saying here is that this verse, this Psalm 110, this John 3.16 of the Old Testament, says that Messiah would be co-equal with God the Father in glory, power, and honor. And that is blasphemy if this is just another man that's being referred to here. The only way that verse could be written without it being blasphemy is if this Lord of David is also God. Not just the son of David, but the son of God. Very God of very God, of one substance with the Father, the Nicene Creed would later say. Yet distinct from God, yet distinct from Yahweh, distinct from the Father. As you have Yahweh and David's Lord referred to in this passage, you also have God the Father and God the Son being referred to in this one passage. John, why on earth are you getting so nitty-gritty into the details here? Because in case you guys haven't noticed, I'm not teaching from a theology textbook. I'm not citing some crazy creed. We're just unpacking a verse in the Old Testament. And again, Old Testament. This verse, Psalm 110 verse 1, was written some, what, 1,400 years before Christ? And yet, just explaining this verse has the same Trinitarian theology that we see in the Nicene Creed, written some 300 years after Jesus' death. Same Trinitarian three-in-one theology, all right there for us. And yet some people want to say these days that the concept of the Trinity was invented by the early church fathers sometime around the Council of Nicaea. That's nonsense. It's always been there if you knew where to look. And there's a dozen other passages that I can look up. Jesus doesn't need a New Testament to prove that God is three in one. In fact, you don't even need just this verse. Isaiah 9, which was going to be our first reading this morning, says that this messianic child who would be born would somehow be mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Did you catch that first phrase? The Messiah would be mighty God. That's a clue for us, isn't it? How can a child be born and be mighty God? There's something more to this. Again, I I, I must cut myself off here for time, but the point is you can disregard anyone who challenges the concept of the Trinity. It's been very well established in Scripture. I don't care when people sat down and wrote down certain creeds or confessions that affirm this, that they're, they're helpful. I'm grateful for the Nicene Creed, for instance. But that's based off of Scripture. This is where I get that from. 
It's helpful, but not necessary. So how do the Pharisees respond to this this challenge that Jesus presents them? Verse 46, And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. (laughs) This question from Jesus hadn't even occurred to them. They weren't even aware this was a question. So they had no answer. Now, they weren't ready to accept the implications of what they just heard. But Jesus just revealed that the son of David was far more than they imagined it being. You know, it's amazing to me, by the way, that Jesus is the only person in history who could say, thus saith the Lord, and I say unto you, at the same level of authority. I can't say that. I can't make up new revelation from God. I can't say I say unto you with nearly the authority of thus saith the Lord. Are you kidding me? But Jesus could. And yet, you know what amazes me? Even though Jesus could, just by speaking, give us new revelation, it's fascinating to me how many times he doesn't just speak on his own authority, but he quotes the scriptures. Yeah, he does speak on his own authority. Don't get, don't mishear me, but when, So often he does speak by quoting and interpreting the scriptures for us. And that's fascinating to me. Jesus is showing us how to be, how how to live as Christians in this world, knowing that we can't just make up interpretations, but showing us how to live on every word of God. Speaking of which, did... That This tells us Jesus' view of Scripture, showing us how important it is and that we can live off of it, that we can live our lives based off of it. Speaking of which, did you see how in verse 43, Jesus says how David wrote this psalm? He says he wrote it in the Spirit, calling him Lord. He wrote in the Spirit. Jesus' view of Scripture is that David wrote this down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These weren't just his own thoughts. It was David's words being guided and directed through the Holy Spirit. Keeping him from error and lead, and keeping him able to write truth. Furthermore, he, Jesus' view of Scripture is amazing. He quotes it with authority to sell, settle matters of temptation and, uh, and questions of debate like we're seeing here. Or when he was being tempted back in uh, Matthew chapter 4 in the wilderness by Satan, he quoted Scripture right back to Satan. That was what helped him to endure temptation. That's how he fought with Satan, throwing out Scripture. And by the way, also, Speak of Jesus' view of Scripture, he affirms many of the so-called controversial sections of the Bible as literal, as historical. He calls Adam and Eve literal and historical back in chapter 19 of this book. He says the same of Jonah in Matthew 12, basing his resurrection, as the historical claim of his resurrection based off the historical Jonah. He affirms both parts of Isaiah in Matthew 8 and John chapter 12 and the book of Daniel in Matthew 24. So the point is here, Jesus affirms all of that is literal and historical. So I'm going to too. (laughs) You know, when people ask me what I or the church, you know, teaches about the scriptures, I just tell them we believe what Jesus believes. Because that's good enough for me. I could care less what other people's views of the scriptures are. I want to view scripture the way Jesus does. But with that backdrop in mind, we return to the first question we came to this morning. What do you think about the Christ? What do you think about the Christ? Are we perpetually amazed by the glory of who Jesus is, the God who became man, the sinless who died for the sinner like me? Because just as Jesus is stretching out the understanding of who the son of David is to the Pharisees, so our understanding of who the son of man ought to be stretched out as well over time. You know, as a young kid, I remember running around these very pews, 
very basic understanding of who Jesus is. I knew that Jesus loves me, and that was about it. (laughs) Couldn't articulate for you too much back then. The things that I know now, I couldn't even explain to five, six-year-old John Motley. (laughs) Not a chance. But I knew Jesus loves me, and that was good enough for me then. Anything above that, you know, was hard for me to process. But as we get older, we're able to understand more. And our minds grow into what we can, the things that we're able to grapple with become greater. And now as I consider that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh, living among us, his Holy Spirit dwelling within us, glorious in his holiness, knowing that Jesus knows the depths of my sinful heart and all the sins that I have committed since I was that little guy running around here. And Jesus still loves me the same, unhindered by all of my disobedience. He still loves me so much. Wow. Those are the things that grip me today. Those are the things that leave me amazed. And you know, it's funny, as I'm, I'm watching now as my kids are becoming older and older, <laughs> and we've already reached that stage in parenting where they're starting to get bored of the things that used to captivate them. You know, they, 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 uh, they need more and more to capture that same sense of wonder. They've outgrown a lot of those little kids' shows that they used to watch, but there's one thing that I think that they will never outgrow, and that's the Bibles we gave them last year. <laughs> those Bibles, I, they're not going to outgrow. They can keep those same things for the rest of their lives. Study them for the rest of their lives. You will never outgrow the wonder of what God has revealed in his word as it reveals God to us more and more. Because, you know, I, I've noticed a trend, even, even in my own life, you know, when I listen to some of my old favorite music or read an old favorite book, watch an old favorite movie or TV show. Now, the first time you watched it, it was magical, right? First time you listened to your favorite album, the first time you read your favorite book, it was, it gripped you. It filled you with wonder to consider it. But then you read it a second time. It's fun and it's joyful. It's a different experience though. The wonder is gone because you're going through it a second time. And, but yet, every time I pick up the scriptures, there's something new. There's something I've never seen before. There's some emphasis that I didn't pick up on last time. I'm like, oh, there's more to this. And it's been like, and it's like that every time I pick up the scriptures. Because there's always more to discover about an infinite God. There's no exhausting this endless mine of wonder and glory. It's been said that, you know, the Bible is written in such a way that the brightest and greatest theologians can drown in the depths of the mysteries of the faith. But yet a little child can just float on the surface, completely safe in the calm of it. I love that. We can all come to these same waters and both be amazed and safe somehow all at the same time. My friends, with that in mind, never be content in your walk with Jesus. There's always something new to be discovered, even in familiar familiar passages. let, Let me be straightforward with us. You know, looking around the room, I know a lot of us have been in this church for a long time. I mean, I, I, I am assuming most of you guys have read the Gospel of Matthew before. How many of you guys, you know, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you guys have learned something since we started this series? <laughs> I mean, I have. And I'm teaching this stuff. <laughs> and I, I get something new every week when I'm preparing to teach up here. Every week there's something that I never saw before. I'm like, wow, that's so cool, Jesus. I never saw that. I still feel like, you know, a a kid playing in a playground with a whole world to discover out there. 
Because I'm not content. There's always more to be discovered about God. I at least know that there's still a whole other world to be discovered. So keep, so keep taking yourself deeper into the waters of Christ. Keep wading yourself deeper into the word, expecting to see something. Because if you're expecting to find something, you probably will. But if you show up to anything thinking, oh, I already know this. You know, I can kind of glaze over this chapter. There's nothing to see here. You're going to miss some gold mines. You're going to miss some diamond mines that way. And I know that. Because that's exactly what the Pharisees did in this passage. They, they missed that the son of David was also the son of God. Not because they, it, it's not in the text as we all saw together, it's there. But they didn't have eyes to see it. Because they thought they understood it. They thought they had everything they needed. I'm good. Please don't ever arrive at that point where you think you know everything you need to know about God. Because you will never know what you're missing and how much deeper those waters go. But it wasn't just that the Pharisees had hard heads that prevented them from seeing these truths about Jesus. It was the hardness of their hearts that was the real problem. See, they were dumbfounded by Jesus' answer. They couldn't answer what he had to say. But they weren't convinced by him. Doesn't say that they went and followed him, did it? No. You see, they were silenced, but they weren't convicted. They were humiliated by Jesus, by him showing them up with his intellect. Them thinking they were the rock star uh, theologians of his day. Jesus shows them up. They were humiliated, but they weren't humbled. They didn't humble themselves under Christ. They didn't follow him. To the best of our knowledge, none of them repented. None of them changed their minds, which is so unfortunate. Jesus isn't in the business of winning arguments. He's after our hearts. That's what he wants from us. Believing that Jesus is a really good scholar or a really good debater, well, that makes us no different than the atheist who believes Jesus was a good teacher. Who lived a long time ago? No, do we, ha we have to see Jesus is more. There's more to him than meets the eye. Will we repent before him, humble ourselves under him, and commit our ways to following the son of David, who is also the son of God? Because you see, lack of evidence is not an enemy to the gospel. Lack of evidence is not an enemy or an obstacle to the gospel. There's plenty of evidence. Self-righteousness is. The Pharisees had more than enough evidence from the historical records. It was their hardness of hearts that stopped them from looking. They had plenty enough evidence for of three years of verifiable miracles from the far north of Israel to the south. Miracles all over the country proving that he was the son of God. All the miracles to prove it, but they didn't have eyes to see it or believe it. And they also had enough evidence from his sinless life that nobody lived a life like Jesus. Nobody could accuse him of wrongdoing, even at his trial that we're coming to. But there was no room in their hearts for Jesus. They decided in advance against him. Because they thought they were enough without him. And look, there is nothing Jesus could have said to change their minds. They made up their mind in advance. Likewise, I know that there's no amount of preaching I can do that can convince somebody against their mind that Jesus is Lord. I can just present the truth. Look, if the Holy Spirit working in your heart as the, whole, as the word of God is read and proclaimed isn't enough, there's nothing I can do to change that. The truth is going to convict you and the Holy Spirit is going to convince you or you're going to resist the Spirit and say, no thanks. And there was no room in any of their hearts for Jesus. It wasn't because Jesus wasn't persuasive enough. I assure you he is. So 
So likewise, we all must have a response to Jesus too. Will we repent of our own self-righteousness and self-sufficiency? Will we each individually admit and declare our own need for Jesus? Our need for his love, our need for his forgiveness and grace that he extends to all men through the cross. Will, and more than, and if you do believe, if you have received that love and forgiveness, if you have come under the grace of God of the new covenant, do we still see Jesus for who he is? Are we going to worship him the way he deserves to be worshipped? Uplifting him in our hearts, recognizing that there is far more than meets the eye of Jesus. What do you think about the Christ? Thanks be to God.